Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you, those online. Good morning to you. Uh, so we're really, really honoured and thrilled today to have a very, very special uh, guest among us. Gavin Calvert is here with us. Um, listened to him already once this morning. You're in for an absolute treat. It was amazing. And Gavin is the CEO of the Evangelical Alliance. He's an author, international speaker and ordained evangelist. And as a church and as a movement, the Vineyard is actually part of the Evangelical Alliance. And Gavin was uh, previously the leader of Youth for Christ, formerly the chair of Spring Harvest. And it's so wonderful to have him with us today. So before he comes to speak, let's just watch a short video about the Evangelical Alliance. Thank you. We are the Evangelical Alliance. We want everyone in the UK to have the opportunity to know Jesus. We are an alliance of evangelicals, of churches and charities, entrepreneurs, grandmas, colleagues, neighbours, friends, loving God, serving each other, declaring with one voice Jesus is our King. We are an alliance of evangelicals, cheering each other on as we seek to be salt and light in the world. You'll find us everywhere in places of influence and where people are hurting the most in parliament in government I got in out say on speaking out on issues that matter the most we're transforming communities changing lives with the amazingly good news of Jesus we are the Evangelical Alliance we pray speak Listen and share. Through challenging times and choppy waters. We stand together and serve each other. We are the Evangelical Alliance. Together, we're making Jesus known. Good morning, it's great to be with you. It's also good for us Southerners to come up north because you realize not all British people aren't unfriendly. You know, some are nice. I don't know about you, but I find it annoying, unintelligent, and somewhat crass when people use their sermons to advertise their ministry. However, um, I'm just feeling like you want to hear a bit more about the Evangelical Alliance. So we'll do a few minutes on the EA, and then I'll go into the talk if that's okay. So the Evangelical Alliance was started in 1846 with two aims. Unite the church in reaching the lost in every part of the UK. And secondly, give the church a clear, effective and united voice into the corridors of power. Those remain our two aims now. That's what we're here for. But let's, let's deal with the E word. You know, because that evangelical word, it is not redundant. But it does need redeeming a little. So let's be clear about what it means, at least here in the UK. It means four things. One, to be an evangelical, we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Stop changing scripture to baptise your culture. And start changing your culture with the truth and the pages of the Word of God. Secondly, we believe the death and resurrection of Jesus is the single most important thing in human history. Thirdly, we believe in the need for conversion. You don't come to faith by accident. Everyone's not going to heaven anyway. You fall on your knees and you meet your Savior. And fourthly, we believe in being active in the world, making the world more like the kingdom. That's why evangelicals were involved in the abolition of the slave trade, providing education first, foundations of the NHS, or in recent years have come up with and delivered Christians Against Poverty, food banks, street pastors. And the Evangelical Alliance is the umbrella body that seeks to bring together these evangelicals. And I think as well, to be an evangelical is an acceptance. No one part of the church is going to change the UK on its own. I mean, I love vineyards. I think it's amazing. But vineyards not going to change the UK on its own. There's 80 network streams or denominations within our membership. We're a stream of streams, if you like. It makes my Sundays fun. You never know what it's going to be like till the first worship song. That tells you whether I can be my natural Sabutio goalkeeper in worship or have to keep my hands in my pockets. Two weeks ago, I was preaching at a Spanish-speaking church in London. 500 people of South American descent gathering together. Church was three and a half hours. They said they wanted a proper sermon. My talk needed to be 45 minutes. What we didn't quite work out, that means it's an hour and a half translated. 
But you know, to me, if I'm honest, apart from the bits I did, it felt like the whole thing was in tongues. But what was amazing by the end was you think there's four to 500 people speaking a different language, wanting to win the city I live in as much as I do, and we're going for it together. Friends, we're part of a vibrant church that wants to go after the lost. You see, to be an evangelical is to be a good news person in a bad news world. That's what we are. And let me encourage you in our work as the Evangelical Alliance, we want every Christian to go so deep in your postcode. Love your place. Go after your place. Do all you can locally. We will not get in your way locally, but be connected to the national story. You know, our nation doesn't believe there's half as many of us as there are. I had a meeting recently with a political party that I won't name which one it was because that's not helpful. They said to me at the end, they said, we never realized there was as many warm, friendly, relatable people as you with such hateful views. <laughs> Friends, at times we need to say we're here for, as good news people in this world. We, let's speak up together. We're speaking directly with government and um, the governments across the UK on all kinds of issues. We've got access to the corridors of power like we've not known in recent times. Two reasons. Pandemic, that gets you in the room. They didn't realize how hard it was to get us out again. Second reason, election year. The one thing we do at the EA liberally is make friends. We are making friends with all kinds of people in the political space because we want to keep speaking up for the church. Now, here's the thing as well. We get asked to speak indirectly on some really hard stuff. We speak on some issues that you wouldn't even want to talk to your neighbor about. You know, conversion therapy legislation. We're against all abusive practices. We want the church to be free to preach what the church needs to preach. Abortion, end-of-life care, those kind of issues that are really hard, but we need a Christian voice on those. But we also get to speak on some amazing issues. What the church is doing in the midst of a cost of living crisis. That's fun because it's all good news. We get to talk about how we, we want the, the nation to keep the freedom to preach Jesus is the only way to God and that not to be offensive. We need to keep speaking up for, for prayer and ministry to not be seen as harmful but as life-giving. But here's the thing, friends. People will listen to us when we speak with one voice and we speak united. And the thing we're trying to do as EA is be really brave but also really kind. Those two things go together. And when I talk about the Evangelical Alliance, by the way, we don't have a staff, we aren't not a staff team, we have one, but the Alliance is the churches, the orgs, the individuals. This church is as much a part of the Evangelical Alliance as I am, and isn't that a great joy? And often people say, well, what real difference does it make? There's lots of things we're working on at the moment I can't really talk about, but we can talk about some things that have happened. A few years ago, the government said they wanted to offset all youth work and Sunday schools. Do you remember that? Public regulation of private religion. I mean, that is a bonkers idea. The idea of a faith illiterate state could critique how well we're discipling our kids. That, that's such an infringement on religious liberty. It's terrifying. And so we went in to the powers that be and said, you can't do this on behalf of all this membership. This is outrageous. There's no way you can do this. And they kicked it into the long grass for now. Why? Because we speak as one. Friends, I promise you that EA will keep speaking up on the issues that matter. We'll keep taking bullets for local churches and Christians. We will keep speaking in and out of the corridors of power on behalf of the church. But will you give us your voice too? Can we take your voice to places it wouldn't get to? And can we unite you with so many others in mission? Friends, going forward, the church membership's really great, but the individual membership's become particularly important in this day. Why? We're in an individualized culture. You'll have noticed that. And in that individualized culture, ask how many people are with you? So we've set a target to go from last year over the next 10 years to go from 18,000 individuals to 50,000 individual members. I'm pleased to tell you we're at 23,000 already, which is a great start. There's two reasons for 50,000. Firstly, that's the same amount of members that the Liberal Democrats have. We're not a political party, so why does that matter? It matters because it gives an ish, a sense of scale. In our culture, so often the loudest noise comes from the smallest seats. What we want to do is give a sense of scale. If we had 50,000 individual members as the EA, a new prime minister would ring me, not the other way around. Secondly, for every person signed up, there's an acceptance that 20 to 25 haven't who are with you. So if we have 50,000 individuals and 3,000 churches, we can talk in representing millions, not hundreds of thousands. That makes such a difference when we're speaking in and out on the hard issues, particularly the difficult issues. So I've said to my board, I'll stay for another decade. So frankly, I'll do whatever I can to get you to sign up because we need the people with us. I am a Marmite figure. The leader of the Evangelical Alliance is Marmite in the UK. Lots of people hate me. They tell me unkindly on social media. If you're with us and you believe in seeing the UK one for Jesus as a good news people, would you consider joining? It's three pound a month as an individual or a couple. You might say, why do you have to pay? You have to pay because 
un, sort of non-monetary memberships are as useful as a Facebook group when you're working with the government. There's no commitment. The reason why we do three pound a month is it's a cup of coffee a month and we're never putting a price up, by the way. It'll never go up. It's not about money. It's about voice. But here's the thing. When you tell them that you've got 23,000 subscriptions, subscribed members, that has power. So the three pound a month is simply, we're never putting it up. It is simply to get the access to the corridors of power. And if you're married, sign up as a couple. Don't even check with your spouse. Counts as two when we go to the Equality Human Rights Commission this week. But if you do sign up, I'm going to give you one of these boxes. It's just got a few presents in it for you to thank you. My wife, Anne and I's latest book, Unleashed. What does it look like to be the Axe Church today? A resource I love we did at EA called Speak Up. The antidote to the newspaper you might read. There's a million face-sharing moments a week in the UK. There's four stories in the media a year of someone getting into trouble. You do the maths. You've got more freedom to share the gospel in the UK than just about any country on earth. If, if you don't use it, though, your children's children won't have it. Here's the thing as well. People say, how do I not get into trouble for sharing my faith at work? There's only one tip I can give you. Share your faith more at work. Your faith is a protected characteristic in law alongside your ethnicity, your sexuality, and your gender. If you only tell people about Jesus once a year and try and make them come to church, that might be proselytizing. If you talk about your faith every week at work, you could not be more protected to keep talking about your faith. Isn't that encouraging? So all we need to do is just talk about Jesus more. What an open goal. There's a couple of other things in here, but finally, if this doesn't swing the deal and you don't join EA today, I don't know what to do. It's an EA key ring. Bear with me. This top bit has got our logo on. It's a fake detachable quid in our increasingly cashless society. When you need a supermarket trolley, you'll be so grateful you joined the EA. When you need a locker at the gym, happy days. All I ask is each time you use yours, would you genuinely use it as the prompt I use mine for? Every time I use mine at my local supermarket, I pray that the church in the UK would be united. I pray that the voice of the church would be heard in the corridors of power. And I pray that together we'd make Jesus known. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we just want to pray for those three things. We pray your church would be united. So united as you prayed in John 17 that the world would be drawn to yourself. I pray that the voice of your church would be heard in the room. I pray that we would have influence in this nation for the sake of your kingdom. And I pray that together we'd make you known. And Lord, as we turn to your word now, we ask you to speak to us. I pray you would be with us too. I pray we'd have fun, Lord. Why would your people gather and not have a good time too? Would we have fun together? But would you move powerfully? Would you be here amongst us? And would you speak to us, Lord, today? Amen. If you've got a Bible, friends, would you mind turning it on or opening it up? We're going to go to Psalm 16. And read this wonderful psalm of David. It says this, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my God. Apart from you I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion of my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Friends, I think so often we are misunderstood in our culture, aren't we? And so often if people have the wrong information, they come to the wrong conclusion, don't they, about anything. I realised this not long ago because um, I live in London, which means a lot of the time I use the, the trains and stuff to get all over the country. You can't do that on a Sunday to get to Hull. So at the weekends, I hire a car to um, drive around and stuff. And, and so I do that with Europe car. That's just for context. Although um, it can be embarrassing at times because we pay for a Corsa and because you do it so often, they give us the best one they have, which includes a hundred grand yellow Mercedes, which if I had that this morning, I'd have to have parked three miles away. But anyway, I don't, fortunately, which is fine. And I was driving to preach in Birmingham and I stopped at the Warwick services for a coffee. 
I went to get my coffee, I went back to my car, I went to reverse, when a big white police van with blue flashing lights pulled up behind me to stop me reversing. Two coppers jumped out of the van, whacked on the front window and asked me to get out of the car where they could see my hands. I got out of the car, they said, where did you get this stolen car from? I said, Europe car. They said, where are you going? I said, to preach in Birmingham. Now, I had the paperwork that proved it was a mistake. And as you can see on a Sunday, I dress a bit like a geography teacher. So I don't look too threatening. But it turns out it was marked as stolen. Four ANPR cameras had gone off between London and the Warwick services. When I went into the services, apparently a warning went out for any police within 10 minutes to come and apprehend this car thief. Do you know my one relief? I'm so pleased I stopped. Can you imagine if I'd gone straight to the church? (laughs) If you rock up at a church to preach and you get arrested, that's a problem, isn't it? They had the wrong information, they came to the wrong conclusion. I think the world's got the wrong information on us. I think the world thinks that we're bad news. I think the world thinks that we're party poopers. I think the world thinks we're irrelevant when really, friends, at this moment in our culture, there has never been a greater opportunity for us to sing a different tune to the culture and it be heard and it be received and it transform the environment around us. Everything around us is failing. Have you noticed this? The secular stories that felt so powerful, they're losing their power. Various prophets such as J.K. Rowling are being used to unstitch the cultural narrative that everyone said was the way to go and point out the folly of it. I have never known, in my time in ministry, I have never known the secular culture to feel less powerful than it feels right now. Honestly, friends, we have got to read the signs of the times because we have been pressed down for too long. We have been worn down and convinced that around us is hopelessness, sterility, and no interest in faith, and that is just not the case. When even Dawkins is calling himself a cultural Christian, you know there's hope. Friends, we are living in a time where the secular stories have never felt so pathetically insignificant, insubstantial, and unsatisfying, and the Jesus story has lost none of its power. This is the moment for us to step forward. And what I love about this psalm is it's basically a psalm ringing with hope. It says, God will preserve the psalmist, verse 1. God is his goodness, verse 2. God is his inheritance, verses 5 and 6. God is always before him, verse 8. God gives hope, verse 9. God is not the God of death, verse 10, but the God of life, verse 11. Isn't this amazing stuff? So simple, so hopeful. Because Jesus took refuge in the Father, verse 1, for the sake of saving a holy people, verse 3. The Father saw his innocence, verse 4, raised him from the dead, verse 10, and declared him the true Holy One and brought him back to heaven to reign at his right hand forever, verse 11. This is full of hope. And I think that we need to step out into our culture with a different tune and make the most of the opportunities in front of us. But the first thing we do before that is we say, Lord, break my heart afresh. Break my heart afresh. Don't let my heart be hard. And and don't let me be cynical or skeptical. For some of us, we've prayed for prodigals to come home for 25 years. We've invited that neighbor to something nine times, and it's all had negative outcomes. You know what? I think we're living in a new day. So so start again. May today be like the first time you pray for that prodigal. May that summer gathering be the first time you invite a neighbour. We're in a different day. Do not live by yesterday's rules in today's world. But say, Lord, break my heart afresh. I'm pretty broken for the UK, but the Lord spoke to me very unsubtly in the middle of last year. Firstly, at the parliamentary prayer breakfast, which is probably less fun than it sounds, but a couple of hundred MPs and a couple of hundred church leaders get together to pray over a very... uh, Disappointing breakfast, let's say. And I was at this last year and I got to my table. There was a load of MPs, but there was also an Iranian pastor. I don't know if you know, but Iran's the fastest growing church in the world. Isn't that amazing? And it's this Iranian pastor and he's had to come here and claim asylum because he was under pressure in Iran. His life was under threat. Why? Because he was leading too many people to Jesus. Wouldn't you love that? Wouldn't you love your life? Well, I wouldn't want my life to be under threat, but imagine that. Why are you coming here? Because I led too many people to Jesus at home. That's an interesting appointment at the immigration office. Anyway, he said to me, what can I pray for for you? I said, could you pray we would see the kind of church growth here you've seen in Iran, but without the persecution? He began to pray in Farsi, and a few lines in, he starts weeping. 
I'm so challenged because I'm broken for the UK, but when did I last weep over this nation? When was my last instinct as I prayed over the UK to just weep the tears of God? Five days later, I'm up in Darlington speaking at a leaders event, and there's a Ukrainian pastor there, he's 57. Apparently, if you're over 55 and you're a man of the cloth, you're allowed a week out a year from Ukraine for spiritual retreat. He'd gone to this conference. He explained to me there's nothing like a war for church growth. He said his church was under 100, it's now over 1,000. He said, what can I pray for for you? I said, could you just pray that we'd see that kind of growth here without the need for a war? He starts praying in Ukrainian, a few lines in, he starts weeping. I was, the Lord was not being subtle with me. I really believe we need to start weeping the tears of God over the communities we're part of, asking the Lord, break us again for these places. And then once our hearts are broken, the Lord gives us, I think, three things that can give us all we need to go out and reach our communities. And the first is this, verse one, he gives us refuge. Psalm 16 makes it really clear, the greatest blessing for those who take refuge in God alone is that very relationship with him. The greatest benefit of trusting God is not what he gives us, it's that very relationship of trust. I think for too many of us, actually, we use God like a vending machine. If you give me this, I'll do this. If you give me, no, 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 this makes it clear. The greatest benefit of knowing the Lord is the fact you know the Lord. Nothing transactional here. You know the Lord and he promises to be your refuge. Verse two, apart from you, I have no good thing. We need to know the Lord is all we need it to be able to feel safe and secure in the world we face because the Lord promises his enduring presence. My grandma had Alzheimer's disease. She had it as bad as you can have it. She spent the last eight years of her life dribbling into a teddy bear. She couldn't speak. The friends were gone. She had one child, my dad. I was one of four grandchildren. She didn't recognize any of us. She basically couldn't do anything anymore, but she'd followed Jesus for 60 years. Where is Jesus when you're old and have lost your mind? My mum went in to see my grandma on her birthday. My mum did it for her benefit, not my grandma's, because my grandma didn't know who my mum was, what her birthday was, let alone presents. And my mum sat in my grandma's bedroom and she said to her, can I pray with you? And my grandma couldn't talk, so being the good evangelical Christian my mum is, she took the silence as the yes she wanted to hear. My mum began to pray for this dear old lady that she might know peace in the midst of mental torture, that she might feel at ease in the midst of all the difficulty. When my mum opened her eyes, she was delighted. My grandma's eyes were shut. Whoa, isn't that wonderful? A moment with the Prince of Peace. But then something unbelievable happened. For the only time in the last eight years of life, my grandma spoke as she prayed. She said, I don't know who I am, and I don't know what I am, and I don't know where I am, but Lord Jesus, please love me. Friends, you can even lose your mind, but you don't lose your refuge in Christ. He is there and he promises to be with us. When we have made God our absolute master, we will experience the security of dwelling in him. God himself is David's refuge everywhere, regardless of place. Right now, it's easy to feel the Lord close, but tomorrow morning at 11.30 in the morning, he will be as much your refuge wherever you find yourself as he is now. He's a portable refuge. Isn't that encouraging? Like a retreat center you go to and leave again. The Lord goes with you everywhere. I think this is why for some of us, um, we need to remind ourselves that he's with us. I get to go to all kinds of places you see on the news, let's say, House of Commons, House of Lords, Metropolitan Police, whatever it might be. And I go into those places representing the church, but most of those places I'm not going in and they're like, oh, please tell us lovely stories about Jesus. I'm going in and I'm scared because I'm having to make a stand for the church or, or, or feel like I'm going into enemy territory at times. Do you know the one thing that makes it all possible, in fact, joyful, is I remind myself every time I'm going in somewhere and I'm a bit scared, I'm like, Lord, I thank you for your greatest promise in the Bible that you're with me. Because the refuge that the Lord provides goes with me into those spaces. And you know what? It's then easier to be brave. I sit in environments where it feels like me against the world. I remind myself, no, no, no. Jesus is here and he is with me. And that makes it possible to take on the giants in front of you. Friends, you might need to remind yourself in the days ahead, he is with you. And, and let's get over one thing as well. When it, when it comes to sort of little moments of bravery, some people aren't brave and other people not. No one's born brave, by the way. You're given chances to be brave. Our culture's giving us a chance to be brave. The bravest person for me in the Bible, Esther. When she goes to see the king, she risks the most radical of haircuts just for showing up. She gives her the head chopped off just for turning up. But she goes and she's brave. Let's choose with the refuge that is the Lord. Let's choose to be those brave people. 
which leans nicely into the second one, which is the Lord gives us refuge, but he also gives us confidence. This is verses two to seven. Gives us confidence. I've never really understood why, where and why the church lost its confidence. I don't know if you saw in the news, I saw it um, last night in the news, I think it was, that they've just sold a, a stop clock from the Titanic that belonged to one of the richest people in the world, and it's just sold for loads of money. It reminded me of a dreadful first date when I was 16, when I went to see that Titanic film. And it was an awful day, and after three and a half hours, the boat sank. I knew that before I went. When you know the end of the story, it really should change how you live in the middle. Friends, we know the end of the story. No matter how many good things happen between now and the end of time, no matter how many revivals there are, renewals there are, no matter, no matter how many cures to incurable diseases are found, no matter how many World Cups England win, and not rugby nonsense, football, right? No matter how many of that happens, no matter how many bad things happen too, however many pandemics there are, how much persecution there is, how, no matter how many good or bad things happen, the end of the story remains the same. Jesus wins. Therefore, as his people in the middle of the story, we need a greater confidence. Where's our confidence gone? Sometimes we need to say, actually, Lord, I know you've got this. You've got my back. I want to be like Paul. You know, when Paul writes to Rome, he says, I'm bound, I'm eager, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Rome was the ultimate in imperial power and pride. It was like the greatest creation man had done. People would go on a religious pilgrimage to stare at the architecture of Rome and see this incredible thing. Wow. Yet Paul was a funny looking little guy with a bull patch, a crooked nose, bad eyesight, bandy legs, no great rhetorical gifts. Funny looking little fella, writes the most powerful city in the world, I'm bound, I'm eager, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What a muppet he must have looked like in his day. But 2,000 years on, Rome is ruined and Jesus is alive. Friends, we have got to rediscover our confidence. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. About this time last year, I um, wrote an open letter to the Church of England. I don't do these things often. Um, but they were wanting to change lots of things around marriage and family and stuff. And it's just, for me, it had gone well over the line. It's not okay. We need to stick to scripture. And no, um, no one else was doing it. So in the end, I reluctantly did it. It was an open letter with Premier and the EA. Got about 100,000 engagements in the first day. Fine. What comes with that, though, is five to 600 personal messages of hate on social media, condemning my kids, all kinds of other things. It was horrible. And that evening, I'm sat in my lounge, feeling sorry for myself. And my wife, Anne, who is kind, godly, warm, compassionate, loving, and pastoral to everyone but me, (laughs) turns to me and says, stop being pathetic and pull yourself together. I'm like, what? He says, your brothers and sisters are losing their lives fighting and contending for scripture all over the world. And you're scared of a few secular humanists. Grow up. Do you know what? I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that because actually what are we afraid of? More people became Christians yesterday than any day since Jesus rose from the dead. More people will become Christians today than did yesterday. People say, what about Britain? I say, no British section in heaven. I long to see it here, but right now globally, more people are becoming Christians than ever before. More people are losing their lives for this faith than ever before. More people are making confident, bold stands because they love Jesus, they've given their life to Jesus and they're sold out for Jesus. Let's not be the pathetic cousin that messes it up by being a little bit scared of someone not liking you. Friends, the Lord is our refuge, but he also brings us confidence. We find in verse two, the psalmist's declaration to the Lord. In verse three, his delight in the Lord's people. And in verse four, his dedication to the Lord's service. He's up for it and he is in. Now, too often with scripture, we just read what it says instead of saying, what does it look like? You know, when I went to Lazarus' tomb in Bethany for the first time, I realized why Jesus has to say, Lazarus, come out. There's 15 beds for dead people. Jesus is so powerful. If he just has come out, all 15 dead people would have walked out at once. Scooby-Doo moment as all the corpses come to life. It's kind of lucky Lazarus wasn't a common name. Imagine if there's three Lazaruses. Not you, sunshine. You go back to sleep. Not you. It's that one I want. When we say, what does it look like in this passage? David is a fugitive. That means he's lost all of his safety and security. That's why he's saying the Lord's his refuge. Yet in his loss, he is able to declare in verse five, the Lord himself is his portion. It's a fact he can delight in verse six. And this is the God to whom he will more than dedicate himself. Verse seven. Friends, don't you find so often we're like, if you just give me this Lord, I'm with you. 
when actually the time has come to say, Lord, thank you for all you've done. I give you my portion. I delight in you. And I will follow you with confidence. Because we too have something to, to declare. and We mustn't forget our confidence. I thank the Lord for reverse mission, which is he's bringing people from all over the world to serve here in the UK. We sent people for years. We're receiving them now. I thank the Lord for it. And one of my friends came to the UK from Uganda as a reverse missionary. He'd never been on an aeroplane before. He gets to Heathrow Airport. He gets his bags. He's got a decision to make he's never made before. Something to declare or nothing to declare. So he goes through something to declare. And he says, I declare that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And by believing, you should have life. The guy at customs is like, you what? He says, I declare that Jesus died for you. And they let him in. Friends, we must not forget we have something to share and something to declare. And we must not lose our confidence. The Lord is our refuge. He's also our confidence. And thirdly, the Lord gives hope. This is verses 8 to 11. I was on a BBC radio chat show coming out of the third third, um, lockdown as we were returning to some sort of normality. And I was on there with two secular humanist academics. Now, honestly, they were as much fun as they sound, but they were incredibly clever. They had brains the size of the solar system. I, I mean, I am not the sharpest tool in the shed. When the Lord was giving stuff out, I got the looks, right? But, you know, these guys, they had brains that were massive. And the host went round, and it was a time when the culture was feeling really hopeless. And these two guys with their great intellect and ability did nothing but make us feel worse. And at the end, the host said, Reverend Calver, what do you think? And I'm like, wow, I think it's a bit sad that in a time when the nation's struggling so much, these two guys who've got intellect that I would love and admire have done nothing but make me feel worse about the situation. And I felt pretty bad coming in here already. I said, for me, it's a completely different situation to what they described. The the landscape we're facing might be difficult, but I stand on a foundation of hope. You see, for me, hope is not a concept. Hope is a person. Hope is a name. His name is Jesus. And when you stand on the unchanging one, it doesn't matter what shifts around you culturally, you're still hopeful. You can still see a better day and you keep moving forward, saying to people around you that there is hope in Jesus. You see, what Jesus did is he came from highest heaven. Then I went into gospel appeal, right? You're not allowed to do that on the radio, but it was live, so I thought I'd have a go. I got halfway through and they cut me off. But who knows how impact it had? (laughs) Friends, we have got to bring hope The cultural tune is not one of hope, but we are carriers of hope. Because of David's intimate relationship with the Lord, he was sure there would be life after exile, even more so life after death. You know what? Fair play, David. This is pre-Jesus. This is pre-Jesus defeating death with a spade. This is pre the resurrection. This is pre all the things we have. And yet he has the eschatological hope to not just believe there's life after exile, but there's life after death. The final verse of Psalm 16 celebrates our faith. Heaven is real and fully satisfying forevermore. But I think we need to populate it a little bit more. It's real and it's coming and we can hold on to that hope, but we also need to share our hope in this moment. Because the Lord is our refuge, therefore he can be our ever-present in times of trouble. The Lord gives us confidence And we should be overflowing with hope. We did some research in 2015 called Talking Jesus. It found that after a conversation with a Christian friend, one in five non-Christians wanted to hear a lot more about their faith. Isn't that exciting? We redid it at the end of 2022. It's now one in three. One in three non-Christians want a conversation with a friend about their faith. They don't want to hear a great talk. They don't want to go on a course. They don't even necessarily want to come to a summer fun day, though that will help through the friendship. What they want to do is they want to chat to their friend going through the same stuff. What is different when you face this with Jesus? And friends, we have got to recalibrate ourselves towards those who don't know Jesus. I absolutely love gathering as church. I I love the, the, the reality of that. But this is boot camp to then be sent out again. And for too long, we've made certain people the evangelists and other people don't do that. I think, forget that word if you don't like it. Let's just talk about witnessing. But every Christian in this season is a witness or an imposter. Let's not be imposters. And let's not just celebrate decisions. You can get hands in the air. Let's celebrate disciples. That takes more people. It takes more work. But the people you have access to are crying out for hope because the secular stories are pathetically insubstantial and the Jesus story changes your life. And I think the time has come for all Christians to play their part in doing that. Because let me be honest too, 
Someone like me, I can be a bit much for some people. I can. My friend, Pastor Agu, who runs the Redeemed Christian Church of God, got me speaking at this prayer meeting with 40,000 Christians. He said, this is my friend Gav. He has the wrong personality for his nationality. I'm a bit in your face for a bit. I'll get some people. You'll get some people. We'll chat to some people. We'll do this. We'll do this. Reaching out to others is a team pursuit. And I really believe we're living in a moment where we could see incredible impact for the kingdom. I really believe we're living in a time we could see incredible breakthrough. I was at a funeral. This guy comes up to me. And I don't often notice another man's physique, but this guy was in his mid-20s. He had muscles popping out of muscles. He was an incredibly good nick. He walks towards me as he approaches me. I just feel like it's looking in a mirror. <laughs> and he comes up to me and he has a go at me. He says, um, I'm really cross with you because my mum loves the program. You and your wife do on TBN and you stopped doing it. You must do some more episodes. She's cross with you. I'm like, I'm really sorry, mate. We can't do everything. He said, no, you haven't heard me. My mum is cross with you. You must do some more. I said, I'm really sorry. We just can't do everything. He said, okay, well, let me tell you a story. He says, during the final lockdown, I got so bored that I watched four of your episodes and I gave my life to Jesus. Now, friends, let me explain. Those were not evangelistic. You're not allowed to do gospel appeals. It was me and Anne chatting about a Bible passage fairly randomly. But you're having to do less in this moment to engage people. People are crying out for more. People are asking for hope. My friend Justin Briley did a piece in The Spectator the other day that said that in the academic circles of Cambridge and Oxford and other places where the doors were shut because Christianity was not seen as academically credible in the last 20 years, suddenly the doors are wide open and you've got all kinds of people giving their lives to Jesus because they've realised that their intellectual capacity is not enough to explain some of the questions they want answered. The only way to explain it is there must be hope and hope must have a name and his name is Jesus Christ. Friends, what a time to be alive. My old man, for any of you that are old enough, my old man used to be uh, lead the Evangelical Alliance years ago. He moved to America in 97, so most of you are too young to remember. But I was chatting to him the other day and he was saying, Gav, when I ran the EA, it was the sort of time when it was like you'd get OBEs and you'd get celebrated by the culture and it was fun, but I'd much rather run it now, he said. I said, why? He said, it's wartime now. Because the stakes are so high spiritually in the nation. The opportunities have never been so great. And the culture's never been so desperate. Friends, you may not get the recognition and celebration of yesteryear. But the opportunity really is there for the UK church. And it's never too late for any of us. You know, we did these videos, just to finish, we did these videos at the EA on sharing your faith. And they were designed to help churches work through sharing your faith. And one was of a lad called Ben in year nine at school. That means he's 13 or 14 years old. If you can share your faith in year nine at school, you can share it anywhere, can't you? His granny didn't realise quite how um, sold out he was for Jesus. I understand that. I've got a year nine lad and he doesn't really like talking to his grandma that much. Partly because she puts the FaceTime to her ear. But anyway, that's a different issue. And uh, his grandma goes to church and she sat there and they introduce this video from the EA. They play it. It's her grandson. She sat in her church as her grandson's talking about sharing his faith at school. She cries a river. Four, when it finishes, four chairs down from her is her friend Reg. Reg is in his 90s. He stands up straight away. I want you all to pray for me. I want to be like Ben. Everyone's like, what? He says, I've never shared my faith. I want you to pray for me that I can share my faith. They all gather around him, pray for him. In Reg's words, over the next few weeks, he comes out as a Christian. He's got a friend called Tommy. They've been friends all their lives. Tommy didn't know Reg was a Christian. Tommy starts coming to church. Six months later, it's Reg who holds the towel when Tommy gets baptized. What I love about the church is it's not just one generation teaching another. It's all mixed up between us all, isn't it? We're all children of God. God doesn't have grandchildren. But I really believe now is the moment, perhaps for a few more Reggies as well, of whatever age, to say, do you know what? I've not done this before. That's okay, but I'm in. I'm in, Lord. I'm in. I want to be part of this. You're my refuge, you're my confidence, give me hope. I am absolutely convinced that a major move of God is coming to the UK. I am absolutely convinced. I'm absolutely convinced it's going to come in my lifetime as well. By the way, if it doesn't, I'll believe it's coming tomorrow, so I'll die in hope. But I'm absolutely convinced it's coming. I'm also convinced that it involves every Christian being in active service in this. Because major moves of God don't take part from the front of an auditorium. They take part with a bunch of people going out and changing the world. 
That's why I love it that the Lord doesn't just promise to be a refuge to some of us. He promises to be a refuge to all of us. The Lord offers confidence to all of us. And the Lord brings hope to all of us. We then long to be the overflow to that, to those around us. I really wholeheartedly believe a major move of God as well is never going to start in the capital city of a, of a nation. It's going to start somewhere else. Hull, Hull really is as good a place as any. And also, what a strategic place to then flood the rest of the nation from. But friends, the real question is, are we up for it? Are we desperate? Do we need the Lord to break our hearts again? Do we need, in fact, Jesus, we invite you to be amongst us. We invite you to be amongst us. We love that you're here, but we invite you to move specifically amongst us. Friends, I wonder if, we're going to just share a couple of things, but I wonder if you need your heart broken afresh, like that Iranian and Ukrainian leader just weeping over the UK. You need your heart broken afresh. Your heart's gone hard for the lost, if you're honest. People's eyes are shut, they're not looking. But if your heart's gone hard for the lost, you need the Lord to soften that today. Do you know, just put it in the air, so I just know if I'm praying for anyone specifically for that. You need God to break your heart again for those who don't know him. Sit those up nice high in the air. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The Lord's seen, but yeah, thank you, Lord. I just pray even now. I pray you would bring tears to eyes as they think of what it would be like to not have you. For some of us, Lord, remind us what it would be like to be a sheep without a shepherd. Break our hearts, Lord, for those who don't know you. Soften our hearts, Lord, for those who've never called you saviour. Replace the judgment with compassion. Help us to see people as you saw them. You died for everyone, Lord. Help us to see people as you see them. Break our hearts afresh. I pray, Lord, for some of us in our, our walks with you that there'd be moments of prayer in the next week where, where the tears would flow as we think of those who don't know you. Just as your tears flowed in Luke 19, looking over Jerusalem. You knew that city would destroy itself because it didn't go your way, but you, you wept. Break our hearts or make us soft. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But then, friends, I, wanna, I just want to ask, if, you really know, if the Lord's been on your case this morning, and you just know, in this next season, you know, when I was at school, every single school report had three words apart from PE. Could do better. Not even should, just could. This is not a moment of condemnation. It's a moment of saying, Lord, help me do better in reaching others going forward. I wonder if today you're like, Lord, I need reminding you're my refuge. But Lord, the confidence, give me my confidence back. The world, the world just chips away at our confidence. And sometimes you say, Lord, give me my confidence back in you that my hope would overflow. If you're, one of, you're sat and you're like, Lord, I would just love to do be so much more effective in your hands at impacting the lives of those who don't yet know you to bring about some of your glory and to see people surrender their lives to you. I just love, Lord, for you to use me more powerfully in that. This is a moment we won't get again, friends. There'll be other moments, but this is a specifically open goal for the church in sharing its hope. And if you feel the challenge from the Lord, I'd just love to pray for you. So if the Lord's challenging you and you're able, would you just stand with me? If you're really feeling, do you know what, Lord? Yes, I want to do better. I want you to move. I want your confidence. I want you to help me. I want you to move in power in and through me. So what's really exciting here is uh, the Lord changed the world with the youth group. The disciples were 15 to 22. There's only 12 of them. And even then, there was a 75% success rate. One doubted him, one denied him, one betrayed him. So... Maybe nine of them had a proper go. What could the Lord do around here with this many of us willing, malleable, desperate? So Lord, we simply say, would you meet with us now, we pray. Would you meet with us now, we pray. For those of us that need to know your loving arms around us as refuge, help us to meet with you in that way now. But we thank you, Lord, ahead of time. You're our refuge every day not just when we're here together. But Lord, I pray for an infusion of confidence. Even now, Lord, I pray you'd be raising confidence in people. Not arrogance, not belligerence, but confidence. We know the end of the story. Help us live more effectively for you in the middle. Lord, we are sorry. We are sorry for where the world's stories have taken over or, or stolen our confidence. We return to you and say, Lord Jesus, please remind us what you've done. 
Remind us who you are. Remind us what we're saved from. And give us the confidence to stand on you, the unchanging one. And then, Lord, we pray there would be a natural overflow of hope. Lord, I thank you that with you as our refuge and as our confidence, the overflow of hope to those around us should be so natural. And Lord, we say, would you give us our communities for your kingdom? But we also say, Lord, we will go to the broken, to the least, the last, and the lost. And we'll do it together. Lord, I pray you'd break our hearts in prayer for the lost. I pray you'd break our, uh, use our hands to bring hope to the lost. But I pray as well, Lord, that there'd just be some natural, supernatural moments where you do wonderful things. But Lord, what we say is we are so grateful for what you're doing in this church. But we cry out, more, Lord. We cry out, more, Lord. We're blown away that a thousand people came to a fun day last year, Lord, but we're believing for a thousand people to come through the doors of your church saying, can you tell me about you, Jesus? Lord, we're so, we're so grateful for all you're doing, but we say more, Lord. We say, use us. And Lord, help us to show in our prayers what we really want to see and help us to live in our lives, lives that bring glory to you. But Lord, help us to feel as bold this time tomorrow as we do now. Move in power with us, we pray. Move in power, we pray. Move in power. And Lord, we also say, we'd love to see this church grow, but we want to see your church in Hull grow. So we pray that what you're doing in us, you would do in the other Christians of this city too. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, today we've, we really have heard Jesus, through Gavin, speaking to us. It's the word of the Lord for us. Such a timely word for us. And um, as we just finish, I just want to share a couple of things. First of all, um, we as a church, we uh, partner with the Evangelical Alliance. We give as a church to the Evangelical Alliance financially. Um, and in the first service, Joni and I, we made the commitment that we want to invest personally and support what Gavin and the team are doing. I think they're doing an outstanding job. They're a prophetic voice to our nation and they're representing many churches, many streams, many networks, denominations, movements like ours. Uh, the cold face and um, it's a beautiful thing they're doing. And I want to encourage us all that Three pounds a month, it is just a cup of coffee. And I think we can all play our part. And I want to encourage you to, um, maybe you need to go home and pray and think about it and sign up online, but uh, Gavin will be at the back and uh, there's an opportunity to, to sign up today. And I think sometimes we've just got to act and be obedient to what we sense the Lord is saying to us now, not say, well, tomorrow or next week. And uh, so let's be, let's be the church, let's be family, let's um, be doers of the word. And, and support um, the Evangelical Alliance. And, and just this uh, few verses, which I think really confirms what Gavin has said. Um, I felt the Lord speak to me about this at a, a leaders meeting in Manchester a couple of weeks ago. Joni and I were sharing it and it says this in Hebrews 10, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which is a great reward. For you have need of endurance that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while and the coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But listen to this, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And I just really pray, Lord, that you would mm -hmm. look upon us and that we'd be a people who do not shrink back, but a people who place their confidence in you and you alone, Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that you would mark us this day with confidence and with courage and with hope to go and be witnesses in our community, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, 
that, Lord, we would leave the 99 and go after the one. Mm. Lord, that is our heart's desire. Lord, we want to, may you look upon us, the whole Vineyard Church and the churches of Hull and see a people who are just sold out, who will be willing to be inconvenienced to see people come to know you. And Lord, we lay down, we repent, we say sorry, Lord, for putting other things as a priority other than that. Lord, we say, let your will be done. Your will be done, your priority. This commission, this call. Lord, mark us this day, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we thank Gavin once again? <laughs>